Hello and welcome to Talking Papers, a podcast where we talk about papers and let the papers do the talking. And today we have Despi Pashalidu, and we're going to talk about neural parts, learning expressive 3D shape abstractions with invertible neural networks. Hello, Despi, and welcome. Can you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm happy to. Okay, so I'm Despi. I am a fourth year PhD student at ETH and Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Turingen. And uh, I did my PhD under the supervision of uh, Andreas Geiger and uh, Luke Van Gool. So uh, during my PhD, I had the chance to work like on 3D representations in general uh, with a particular focus on primitive based um, Uh, 3D representations. At the moment, I'm doing an internship at NVIDIA Research under the guidance of um, Sanya Fiedler. I'm super happy for that. She's awesome. And I had the opportunity to do this project jointly with Andreas, which is my amazing PhD advisor, Sanya Fiedler, and uh, an old colleague of mine, Angelos Katharopoulos, which is also Greek, and he's also a PhD student at um, EPFL and EDAP. And um, we were, I was very lucky to have this great collaborator. So we did, this project was done like um, in parallel um, with uh, another project that I'm currently working with NVIDIA. And we were very lucky to see it, you know, coming to life. <laughs> so Let's dive in. So abstract style TLDR, what is this paper about? During uh, the, my PhD, I I tried to tackle the prob- problem of um, primitive-based uh, 3D reconstructions. So let me very briefly tell you what are primitives, because actually not many people know, you know, because you read the paper. So primitives are like a way of representing uh, shapes using a collection of parts. This is not something new. This is not something that I invented. No, by no means. This is actually quite old. Um, and it was done like in the early days of computer vision. And uh, the reason why I was drawn to it and the reason why I wanted to, you know, invest these valuable years of my PhD on primitive-based learning is because I was also, I was very excited about the idea of having interpretable representation. So what is interpretable representations? Representations that we humans can, can somehow understand or interpret in a way that we normally perceive uh, our 3D world. Uh, and why primitives can yield interpretable representation? So the reason why this is possible is because they can yield semantically meaningful parts. So parts that we humans can see and draw the connection between parts that we know as heads, limbs, legs, tails, etc. So as I said before, this work is a kind of an epilogue of uh, how can we learn expressive uh, 3D primitives. And um, our, main con- our main idea and what we wanted to show is that we can learn primitives that are not limited to a specific family of shapes, cubes, spheres, ellipsoids, but instead can take any possible shape. This can be um, tails, uh, legs, heads, uh, um whatever you want to to model like actual 3d geometries that you can observe in the 3d world so this was like the my motivation for that project uh, of course uh, the capacity the representation capacity of our existing model cannot model everything that you want of course this is obvious but i think it is a very important step towards this direction so this is the motivation and um, what uh, the paper technically does is it proposes a 3d primitive representation for uh, modeling um, geometries that are not limited to a specific family of shapes so this is uh, not two sentences but uh, this would be the abstract very briefly why is this problem important where, where can we use uh this where, where can you take this paper and plug it in and it it becomes useful? So first of all, this is a fantastic question. Um, I think, and let me make a small parenthesis here. One of the most important lessons that I learned throughout my PhD, and I'm really thankful because Andreas helped me, Andreas Geiger, my supervisor, really helped me learn this, is uh, why do we care? Why is this problem important? And uh, to be honest with you, after having published uh, three papers on that particular topic, I 
I feel now confident, kind of confident, to answer this question. Um, so first of all, primitives can be useful for applications such as animations. Uh, if you want to have, um, uh, it has it has been widely used in the past for robotics applications. So if you want to have like a robotic arm that can grasp objects, you want to be able to model the geometry of a specific part. So for this kind of tasks, this is useful. I personally am super excited about uh, the possibility of applying these primitives on the content creation tools. So having uh, tools where you can combine parts and generate objects, creatures, scenes. And ideally you want to combine this with a generative model and do this automatically. I think this is one of the killer applications. And by the way, this is also an application that uh, Sanya pointed me out to, so I feel I should give the credits to her because I think this is a really um, a really nice future research direction. So um, another uh, task that I'm very excited about that I haven't worked on is animations. The cool thing about uh, parts is that you can have their geometry, which means that you can easily deform them and um, control where they move and this is very nice. Actually, yesterday I found, I read a very nice paper on archive from, uh, unfortunately, I don't remember the, the main author, but I know the last authors, Angzuka Nazava and Noah Snavely, where they deform um, 3D shapes. They have, they detect unsupervised, uh, in an unsupervised fashion key points, and they detect and they manage to deform um, the 3D geometry. I think this application has also some very nice connection with primitives and it's a very nice um, uh, scenario. So I think I, I've already mentioned briefly or not briefly <laughs> uh, some applications uh, that could be useful. And uh, more theoretically, the reason why I think what we did is important is be because it decouples the geometric accuracy with the parsimony. So why what this paper makes possible that wasn't possible before is that it technically allows us to learn geometrically accurate parts and to reconstruct objects with parts that are both geometrically accurate while being able to keep a small number of primitives. Back, like a previous work, needed to use many primitives to learn complex 3D geometries, whereas we can do it like with only five or two or three. And the reason for that is that prior work relied on simple shapes, whereas our representation does not impose any constraint on the shape of the predicted primitives. Mm -hmm. So this is why what we did is important. Yeah, so um, you kind of started touching on, on the 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 challenges here, right? So one of the challenges is is actually mm -hmm. the primitives themselves, right? So can you can you elaborate a bit about the yes. challenges that you faced when starting to work on this? Uh, okay, so one obvious challenge that I have been thinking about, and I, to be honest with you, I never really took the time to think about it properly, but I feel this is the next uh, thing in primitive-based learning is what makes a part a part. How do you define partness? Like, what is a part? Uh, we tend to learn primitives by optimizing the geometry such that the predicted shape matches the shape of the target object. And after having published like some papers on that domain and being quite familiar with the related work, I can tell you that I feel that um, the abstractions that we learn are not really semantic. So I don't think that the network really, really learns semantic shape abstractions. I think that the network learns to spatially arrange parts across the object. And as a result, because objects are consistent, right? We, we see the same part being positioned in the same place, in the same spot, and we get the feeling that the network knows that this specific part is used for modeling heads, etc. So one challenge in general, not related to this uh, project, is to rethink a bit how can we define parts, how we can learn parts in an unsupervised fashion, because we do not have supervision in terms of primitive annotations. Uh, to be more specific for the challenges that we faced for that paper, 
the idea of um, of learning a primitive as a deformation of a sphere was an idea that I had like two years ago, to be honest. Um, the main challenge, and actually this paper worked quite smoothly, that was very nice. Um, the main challenge that we had was um, um, how can we, what kind of invertible neural network can we use to 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 have this whole pipeline work we tried a few all of them kind of worked it wasn't that one failed terribly but eventually we had to figure out what is the best and you know since everything was kind of working that was like a bit tricky moving on to the related work section of the of the paper so for the novice listeners of this podcast which one or two papers would you recommend reading before reading this paper? I think that um, the original paper that initiated this line of research, and we should really give credits to Subham Tulsiani for that, is the work of volumetric primitives from CVPR 2017 from um, Subham Tulsiani. He's great. Everybody knows him, but I really like his work. Uh, following his work, uh, the follow-up work that I did uh, in CVPR 2019, the Superquadrix Revisited paper. Uh, I think like this is like a follow-up work that is quite important. And more recently, one work that was actually very popular last year, and I think is a very cool contribution to the field, is uh, the work from uh, Be- uh, Boyang Deng. I hope I pronounce his name properly. Uh, CVXNet. Uh, from um, last year's CVPR in collaboration with uh, Google. So this is also a very, very nice work. And I think that people should definitely read it because actually what they do is that they go a step forward from superquadrix and they propose to represent primitives using convex shapes. So I think this is also very nice work that people should definitely read. Oh, and there is another one. Sorry, but I also really have to mention this. There is uh, the paper. The paper is called Neural Star Domain, NSD. I'm really sorry, but I don't remember the authors of that. This is really inappropriate. But I know that is a NeurIPS uh, 2020 paper. So this is also very nice, uh, very cool uh, work that is following the same line of work as uh, we did and CVXNet did. And yeah, and now, sorry, but I also have to mention another one. So the work of um, Kyle Genova, the structured implicit functions. This is also very nice. Definitely check them out. On YouTube in the description, I'm going to add the links to everything so everybody can can have access to to those papers. Now we're getting to the approach section of the paper, so kind of starting to dive in deep. But but let's start with a high as high level as we can. So what's the input? What's the output? The input to the system is an RGB image, and the output should be. Uh, a set of primitives that describe the object, the 3D geometry of uh, the object depicted on the image. The supervision that we have comes from uh, the 3D mesh. Uh, In particular, we do not use, um, we sample points on the surface of the um, object, which we refer to as surface samples, as well as occupancy pairs, which is um, uh, points that are inside and outside the 3D geometry, where we assign uh, labels based on whether they're internal or external um, to the mesh surface. And uh, this is where our supervision comes from. So the input is an image, the supervision are 3D points on the surface inside and outside um, the target object. And the output is a set of primitives. Mm-hmm. So, so just to be clear, so the, the, the RGB image, is that like mm-hmm. a rendering of that object that you use for supervision or could it be something else? Mm-hmm. So uh, it depends on the data set. So for example, for the shape net, it is not a rendering of the object. For dynamic Faust, we use a rendering of the objects. In general, we want to... Uh, op- images to not have backgrounds. I've never tested it on uh, real images, like images that have background, but I don't think it will uh, fail horribly. Like if it is trained on this kind of data, I think it would be able to learn it. I don't see a reason why, you know, it would fail. Yeah, and even if it does, you can always segment segment it out, right? Okay, so so you got your input image, 
then what happens? So it's very simple. Like we can decompose the whole uh, pipeline into two components. So the first component, which we refer to as a feature extractor, takes the input image and um, predicts some features for the image. You can think of it as like a global feature representation of the image. And in addition to that, what we need to do in order to be able to learn multiple primitives is we augment uh, we add a per-primitive uh, embedding. So what we do next is uh, we uh, concatenate this global feature representation with the per-primitive embedding, and this gives us a per-primitive shape embedding. This um, embedding is used for conditioning the INN on the different primitives. So as I said before, what we use to learn... So the whole idea of this... Um, paper is that we define primitives as the deformation of a sphere into a 3D object. This 3D object can be arbitrarily complex. The way that we learn this deformation, or more accurately, the way that we parameterize this deformation is by using an invertible neural network. The invertible neural network, which is the second component of our architecture, is conditioned on a specific primitive embedding. And uh, the reason why we need to do that is in order to be able to use the same INN for learning multiple primitives. Alternatively, we could have multiple INNs, one for each primitive. But as you can imagine, this would have been a bit more slow and not so efficient. So this is why we do it like this with the conditioning, as I described before. Mm -hmm. So this... Um additional representation that creates more primitives. Where, where does it come from? So how do you generate that? I start with random weights that are optimized, that, that are not optimized, but they are like um, concatenated and every primitive has its own uh, feature representation. So this is how the network, the INN, can identify the specific primitive that it corresponds to. Mm -hmm. So this is how it works. But you can, like, it's standard um, embedding. It's not, and nothing fancy there. <laughs> and this is used as conditioning into the INN. And uh, the INN then, the, we use uh, the real NVP, which is one of the most uh, simple invertible neural networks. Uh, so technically, what the INN implements, it, it implements two kinds of transformations, translation and scaling. And by learning translation and scaling, we can uh, scale and deform the sphere and position it into different um, locations. And uh, this allows us to learn arbitrarily uh, complex uh, primitives that, of course, have genus zero shape. So this is like one. Mm -hmm. One right, because it's limitation. it's from a sphere, right? Exactly. If we had a torus instead of a sphere, we could have genus one um, shape. And actually, this is something that would be very cool to try. Uh, I think this is a very exciting like direction. Okay, so so you got your image, you 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 put it through the mm -hmm. ResNet network part, you concatenated your exactly. primitives, exactly. you fed that into it, your INN, you get your output. Mm -hmm. How do you train this? Fun. Exactly. So this now we come back to the challenge that we said. So why do we need an INN? Why can't we just use an MLP, right? We want to learn a homeomorphism. So back in CVPR 2018, there was this very nice uh, paper from um, uh, et al., uh, AtlasNet paper, uh, where they implemented a homeomorphism using an MLP. What you lose if you use an MLP is that you cannot go take the inverse of the homeomorphism. You can only you can only have the forward mapping of the homeomorphism. So you can only go from the sphere to the object, but you cannot go back from the object to the sphere. And as a result, you cannot impose various constraints that actually that are actually quite cool. So and by constraints, what we mean, we mean optimization objectives. So how do we train this whole thing? 
as I said in the beginning, we have like uh, two kinds of supervision. We have a set of um, points on the surface of the target object, which we refer to as surface samples, as well as a set of occupancy pairs that are 3D points inside and outside the target mess that are associated with a label that indicates whether this point is internal or external to the mesh. By having these two sources of supervision, surface and volumetric samples, we define two kinds of geometric losses. Uh, the first one that is defined on uh, the um, surface samples is a simple chamfer loss. And what we want to, to have is we want to make sure that points that are on the surface of the object will also be on the surface of the sphere. So what we do is that we sample points on the, on the target object, we pass them through the INN, and if we bring them back, we want these points, the predicted points, to be close to the target objects that were originally on the 3D surface. So this is one uh, kind of supervision. The next kind of supervision, which was actually one of the main challenges, <laughs> this was tricky to make uh, to make it work was uh, to map a volumetric sample so what you want to to ensure what you want to enforce is that um, the volume of uh, the 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 volume of the predicted primitive will be similar to the volume of the target object again we want points that are internal to the sphere to the target object i'm sorry to also be internal to the sphere and points that are external to be external. And this is actually, by the way, exactly what I'm describing here was the motivation for this project. So I really like the idea of being able to define the losses on a sphere that we are, um, th for which we know the topology and like, it is a very well-defined shape. So this is like also one of the, the motivations of this work. So these are the two main geometric losses that we had. Um, the second loss that we used was to enforce that we won't have overlapping primitives. So the whole idea is to, ha is to have semantically meaningful parts. So we really want our parts to have a semantic meaning. So we wanted to be able to have primitives that are not overlapping with one another. Uh, another loss that we use is, uh, this is uh, used uh, mainly to, actually this is an engineering trick, <laughs> if I want to be honest, to avoid having degenerate um, primitive arrangements. So we didn't want to have uh, primitives that were either too small or that were not used. So we impose a constraint that all primitives participate in uh, the in the predicted shape. And last but not least, the final loss that actually does not have a big impact on the reconstruction quality, like in terms of the numbers, but it actually has a very important impact on like the visual uh, perception that we have on the primitives. And this can be seen like on an ablation that we have in the supplementary, is the normals consistency loss. So what this loss enforces is that the normals will be consistent between um, the target and the predicted shape. And as a result, this yields very smooth normals uh, when two primitives meet one another, which is a very nice um, property, I think. Okay, so you got all your losses now. We, we know what our input is, what our output is. So let's talk results. So what metrics did you use? What do you want to check? How do you evaluate this kind of problem? Right? How do you evaluate creating primitives? What makes a good primitive? <laughs> You ask uh, fantastic questions, like your questions are up to the point, because actually, I personally think that we are evaluating primitives incorrectly. So um, let me uh, briefly tell you what I wanted or like what uh, when we were working on that, me and Angelos, uh, we were discussing of how can we like do the structuring like of the of the experiment section. And um, what we were discussing is that um, what we really want to show is that our representation... So first of all, we want to learn primitives because the primitives can learn semantically meaningful parts. If you look at an object, any object, you do not... It, it, it only requires maximum five, let's say 10 
semantically meaningful part. Like your chair, your car, airplanes, the the parts that have a semantic identity are very few. So what we really wanted to show is that uh, papers and approaches that uh, have to increase the number of primitives to get accurate reconstructions are not following um, the right way. Uh, they are like, um, this is not very accurate, but technically I was very concerned whether this is the way that we should tackle this problem. So what we really wanted to show is that we are able to learn very accurate reconstructions with few parts. So the whole experimental section was structured behind this idea. Uh, the standard, in, in general, primitive-based representations are evaluated with respect to the reconstruction accuracy. So the idea is to measure chamfer loss, chamfer distance, I'm sorry, and IOU in order to be able to judge how good this primitive reconstructs a 3D geometry. The second thing that is very important is a measure of uh, semantic consistency. And this is where all the problems begin. <laughs> So to be honest with you, we do not have a good measure for that. We always do some tricks, but I kind of feel that we can easily cheat these uh, metrics by selecting, uh, by, you know, by structuring your problem properly. So in this paper, what we did is a similar uh, pipeline that a similar experiment that was proposed in CVXNet, as I mentioned, the paper from CVPR 2020. Um, so this is like um, uh, what the, the experimental evaluations that we also adopted for our work. But I think that this is also not very good. So what you want to measure is whether a same point, the same point is consistently represented by the same part. And how you do it, you define like a small classification error. But this is also not an optimal metric. This is a big challenge, I think. And I, I really believe we need to rethink how we measure this. Well, you don't use semantics in training, right? You, you don't have any notion of, of no. the different parts when you train. Exactly. So I found it really surprising that they actually learn semantic things. I mean, it makes sense that it would, mm. you know, decompose geometrically, you know, decompose space in some way. But the fact that it did it with mm -hmm. some semantic meaning, that was interesting. I mean, was that expected or was that like a surprise to you as well? No, no, no. This is ex this is very expected, and this is like um, the main selling point of primitive based representation. So, what what a reviewer expects to see in a primitive based paper is uh, that uh, uh, okay. It depends, of course, on like the positioning of the paper. But in general, let's say you want to see uh, primitives that are semantically consistent. So, you want to see that the same part is consistently used for representing the same object, uh, the same object part ac across a family of objects. Um, and it was like, uh, this was also noticed back like uh, in the volumetric primitive papers of uh, Subam Tulsiani, where uh, uh, he used cubo cuboids and cuboids were very consistent as well. Mm -hmm. Have you like, okay, I guess this is kind of like a, a bit of outside the scope of the paper, but have you considered using, I mean, the ShapeNet, ShapeNet data set and there's PartNet data set that actually have semantic mm -hmm. parts. Have you been thinking about mm -hmm. how to integrate that in, into the to this pipeline? Of course. So um, I didn't want to do that. I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, because I wanted to be able to do to learn this whole pipeline in an unsupervised mm. fashion. There are many exciting works from Leo Gibas lab. Uh, Kaitsun Mo, for example, is doing very cool work in this direction where they use um, supervision to learn primitives. Also, Niloi Mitra has like very cool work. Like there are many people, like I cannot even start to mention like all these people that are working like on the supervised um, primitive-based learning. Mm. Uh, but um, we didn't want to do mm -hmm. that. But you are very correct about one thing that like another way to evaluate the semantic consistency is using the part net uh, parts. So you can uh, use the, um, the semantic abstractions provided 
in partners and evaluate your reconstruction on those. And we didn't do that. We follow the same experimental evaluation of CVXNet for that paper. But there is an alternative experiment. Mm -hmm. When do you guys fail? What are the fail cases? So first of all, if I want to be fair, actually the model works surprisingly uh, consistent. So this is something that I wasn't, I haven't experienced with my previous works, but this one like is very, very consistent. So this is like a good thing. Um, one failure case that we had like to, to tackle was when we trained like for objects that um, had, um, let's say, very thin structures such as tables and uh, or chairs etc sometimes you could notice that, that um, uh, the parts were not like ideally what i would like to see i would like to see that uh, for every um, leg of the chair we have a part a specific part this wasn't always the case so i've seen some examples where uh, the part was um, uh, the leg the same primitive was used for representing the leg of the chair as well as a part of the base. You know, it's unsupervised, so you cannot actually control this, but uh, this is actually something that I wouldn't like to see, let's say. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing. Uh, the second thing that I feel uh, can like be improved in the future and where we had to, you know, we had to play a bit with uh, regularizers is what I mentioned before about having like a loss that prevents degenerate solution. Mm -hmm. So this shouldn't be the case. I feel that adding this loss is uh, problematic in a sense that the network should be able to figure this out on its own. Uh, how this could be done, I don't know. But, you know, like adding this small term actually helped a lot and improved a lot the results. And last but not least, one, um, one issue, it's not really an issue, but like this is a general problem that uh, we had with um, invertible neural networks is that um, the way that they work is that you need to transform more points from uh, the space of the sphere to the space of the target object. And to do that, this requires uh, quite a lot of memory. So we had to use relatively big GPUs. And as a result, if you want to be able to scale these models to use like 500 primitives or 1000 primitives, 500 or 1000 doesn't make much sense because this wouldn't be semantically meaningful parts. But let's say that you want to do a reconstruction of a room, for example, where you have multiple objects. This would have been a bit more tricky. But yeah, like um, increasing uh, the number of primitives above 20 or 25 was tricky. It still worked. So we don't have this kind of results on the paper because we really wanted to show that you do not need so many primitives. But um, this was a challenge, like making it work for more primitives, not in terms of like uh, the method was the same. But you know, you had to engineer things to make uh, things fit to the GPU. So the, the engineering wise, it was like a bit tricky. Okay, so conclusion, future work, how do you see the impact the paper had on the field? And what would you recommend early PhD students that want to pick this topic up and do something exciting, what would you recommend them? So technically what I what we did here and what I think is the major impact of this paper is that uh, we allowed to have primitives that have no constraint on the shape of the primitive, on the predicted primitive. So the primitive can be anything. This is very cool. Uh, this can be used for many applications, and I think um, this is the, the major contribution of our work, that uh, now primitives can literally be anything you like. And uh, yeah, uh, follow-up um, uh, applications are too many. One thing would be to try to increase the resolution of uh, the predicted primitive. So right now we have, in general, everyone is using um, primitives with uh, low resolution. When I say resolution, I mean number of um, uh, of um, um, predicted of points because how we learn them is by sampling points. So it would be nice to be able to use primitives for yielding really accurate reconstructions like faces. No one has ever done it. 
how would it work to be able like to reconstruct the nose and like really ha- use primitives for have semantic yet accurate reconstruction. So this is one direction that I feel is exciting. But to be honest, the most exciting thing that I would like to see in the future is uh, using primitives for content creation tools. So using primitives as uh, parts in order to allow artists to combine parts and uh, learn a generative model of primitives. So for me, that would be a killer application and a really nice thing to try. And I know that already some people are working on this, which is very exciting. Yeah, really exciting. I am not working on that, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, I know some other students that are trying to tackle this, and I think it's very, very nice. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah. One of the things that I, I don't know, I read the paper and was like, I wonder if we can learn the number of primitives that we need to use, right? Because you're using fixed numbers of primitives. And I'm like, well, a chair has, exactly. I don't know, four legs, one seat, one back. So that's about six primitives. So... Can I learn that this one is six primitives this and is, the table maybe five because it doesn't have the back? This is a fantastic question. Uh, this would be really cool, actually. In the first paper that I did, the Super Quadrix Revisited paper, we were supporting a variable number of parts, as well as in the follow-up work that we had with the um, hierarchical shape abstractions, I like to call this HSQ's paper from last year's CVPR. So... These two works supported a variable number of parts. So again, you needed to define the maximum number of primitives and the network was able to define to decide on its own. I agree. I think this is a very cool uh, direction. And honestly, I don't have a good answer on that. Like some things that I tried failed miserably. Mm. And it's, it's a very tricky problem. I, I, I really like this direction. And I think it would be very cool. And it actually might be the way, you know, to really learn meaningful parts like actually learn parts okay cool so now for my favorite part of the podcast which is what did reviewer two say so please share um some Mm -hmm. reviews that you had in the review process that you ended up using changing the paper or were insightful Mm -hmm. in some way yeah so uh, to be honest we got uh, quite mixed reviews for this paper so we had like um, a reviewer that was very supportive like they really liked the paper and uh, we had some reviewers that had mixed feelings Okay, so for example, um, since you mentioned, I don't know why everyone says like uh, that uh, the reviewer two is uh, most of the times the most uh, strict reviewer, but I think in our case, uh, reviewer two was mainly um, skeptical about uh, what are the applications of uh, this work, uh, how what are like um, some scenarios where this kind of representations could be useful. And why should someone use uh, choose this primitive representation over cuboids, ellipsoids, or something like that? Uh, even though I see the reasoning behind this question, so some people actually said this concern, and they I have discussed this with um, some people from Adobe, where they also expressed a similar concern. Uh, the truth is, like I think this is a more theoretical and philosophical question of. Uh, what kind of primitives do we want to have? I think a reviewer too uh, supported the idea of having simpler primitives. And I think that if we want to be able to use something really useful with the primitives, then we really need to have more expressive primitives, more powerful primitives. So I think that I disagree with uh, that concern regarding simplicity because I feel that whatever you can do with cuboids, you can do with neural parts, right? And yeah, there is like um, a whole field that is going to more expressive primitives. But that was uh, the main concern. The main concern was uh, related to what is the usefulness and why would we like to have like uh, these expressive um, primitives but yeah like I, if i can give an advice to students uh, that also andreas gave to me when i was writing the very battles in the first year of my phd uh, is to take a step back relax and uh, don't think it is personal i was uh, very lucky throughout these review processes throughout the year i got much better and I don't think reviewers have like, uh, you know, like they don't have anything personal with you, right? <laughs> they 
like be open-minded about that and just try to get whatever is useful and one thing that I always do is I first try the very angry rebuttal and then I spend the re remaining of my week, you know, toning it down and making it sound more polite because, you know, like, of course, this is your work and when people like do reviews that you don't agree with, it's completely normal to feel, I don't know, offended or hurt or whatever. Don't be offended. I don't think it's personal just uh, try to address uh, the concerns of the reviewers and I think everything will work out eventually. Despi, thank you very much for being a part of this podcast. Thank you for listening. That's it for this episode of Talking Papers. Please subscribe to the podcast feed on your favorite podcast app. All links are available in this episode description and on the Talking Papers website. If you would like to be a guest on the podcast, sponsor it, or just share your thoughts with us, feel free to email talking.papers.podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to tune in every week for the latest episodes. And until then, let your papers do the talking.